think congratulations on the movie. Well, thank you. This seems like a, sort of a different thing for you because you're, you, you're associated with a lot of blockbusters. This is a much more intimate film in a sense in that regard. Um, what kind of freedoms did you get to experience as a filmmaker on this one that you have it on, like, say, Geostorm? Well, th this is a totally different tone for me. I mean, I've never done anything remotely like this, so I had to rethink uh, the way I shoot things, the, the lenses I use, the blocking that I would do. So it was, it was, it was really kind of starting over as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the greatest thing was working independently. You know, getting to, to to have the cast that I want, getting to use the crew that I want to use, uh, not having to argue about the story development. Uh, there was something very pure about the way we did this, and something very. Um, very lovely about how the whole crew came together and the cast. You know, when you do something independently and there's not a giant studio there, the motivations are very different. And you see people working together in a way that that's so brings you back to the basics about why we wanted to be filmmakers in the first place. I, I found the experience to be absolutely rejuvenating. Yeah, it's great to have all those freedoms, you know, because it, it's not always the case. I mean, you have people over your head. And, uh... Yeah, and I think it's gotten worse and worse. You know, I think it, it you know, with with movies costing more to make and more to to market, uh, there's just a lot of voices that have gotten involved that didn't used to be involved, and I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. True, true, yeah. And you really wanted to work with Brandon Boyce, who wrote the screenplay. He's best known for App Pupil. Yeah. What was it specifically about the App Pupil screenplay that made you want to work with Brandon? Well, the thing in App Pupil that I think this movie shares is that the monster of the movie is something real. Those Nazis existed, and they existed after the war. And the idea that one could be living across the street from you was a horrifying idea. And the psychotic in this film is not so over the top that it's not realistic. These people exist. This man could be living down the hall from you. And that, to me, is so much more terrifying than the supernatural or space aliens or anything else because this is what I could actually run into in life. And that, to me, uh, just scared the bejesus out of me. It's very scary because, yeah, David, the way he plays the character, he, he's a very complex character. He's not just solely evil. This is a guy who's been hurt in some way, or his worldview has been so twisted that, you know, no amount of therapy can merely bring him back. You know? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, he, he is uh, he's a person who has, does not have the capacity to feel empathy, does not have the ability to feel guilt. Marry that with all the money in the world, that is a very dangerous person. Yes. Yes, very true. Evil Bruce Wayne. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And movies like this, I mean, I like these cat and mouse game movies because it deals with sort of like the psychology, not just of the antagonist, but the protagonist. And, yeah. and basically, this is a guy who's, the, the main protagonist is a freewheeling guy who's into home robberies, but then he's presented with a situation that he cannot just turn back from. Right. And he's presented by a lot of people who are quick to dismiss him. Uh, I like movies like this. You, it always threatens to have like these plot holes and stuff like this that makes it that. I mean, how do you deal with stuff like? Did you go through the script beforehand? Well, the the very first draft of the script was really good. You know, so it it, ne it never needed any kind of um, spine breaking rewrites. Okay. All the rewrites really were for location or when the actors wanted to deepen out their characters and we started talking it through with them and then really good ideas would come out. But for the, fir for the most part, Brandon did, did a wonderful job. You know, a, a lot of times in movies like this, uh, they, they make the cops stupid. And it, it's kind of an easy way out when you're a writer. And what, what I admired about Brandon is the cops are never dumb in this. The, the villain is just smarter. Yeah. He's just able to move the chess pieces a little bit faster than they can keep up with. And I think that just, it, it makes it a harder task as a writer, but I think it makes for a much more compelling and interesting film. Speaking of the location, I mean, Portland, Oregon, this is, it's an interesting location, it's been used a lot recently, and uh, what did it offer you that other cities in America would not have offered? The thing about Portland that I, that I find fascinating, because I spent a lot of time up there, mm -hmm. is that it has all the toys of a big city, you know, it's got the giant stadiums, it has the racetrack, it has big buildings, but the heart and soul of the town is a small town. Everybody knows everybody. There are no secrets in Portland. Uh, if something happens, everybody knows about it. And that created an intimacy within a larger setting that I thought was just perfect for this movie. You know, there, there's, there's a part of the film where uh, 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 Brandon said it's kind of like Iago slowly, systematically taking apart Othello. And 
if that were to be in Los Angeles, that would be kind of unknown. In Portland, it would be humiliating. Everybody would know what's going on. So I think the, the city is actually the third character of the movie. It is. It absolutely is, yeah. And not in a Portlandia kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> Which could have been an interesting version also. <laughs> Which could have been, yeah. But it